My power's back. We're back to being a two-man show. Just in time for the Guardians to be back. Let's get into it. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show today. Today's episode is brought to you by SupplyHouse.com, a reliable way to get parts fast. Shop for your next plumbing, HVAC, or electrical job and get fast shipping from coast to coast at SupplyHouse.com. On today's show, Guardians clinch the season series against the Twins. We'll talk about the importance of that. Talk about our first impressions of Alex Cobb. We'll also talk about the Guardians. Two in a row. One more game, and that is a winning streak. Uh, and, of course, we'll talk about some roster tweaks as well to see if we can get this team into position to avoid some of the peaks and valleys they've had uh, as of late. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. I want to thank each and every one of you and many of our everydayers. One of our everydayers complained that our heights weren't aligned. So if anyone who's watching the video and saw me try to adjust the height there, that was for um, said listener. Hello, for those who don't know me, I'm Jeff Ellis, one of your two hosts here. Before I, I'm one of the OG hosts in terms of Locked On for Baseball. For that, it was a lead draft and prospect analyst at Scout in 24 uh, 7. Occasional contributor, it feels like right now, to WTAM's after show, and uh, which I appreciate. Thank you to, to Dennis out there. And then um, I was your uh, seventh favorite blogger at every Cleveland sports blog that has and will exist. Ooh, seven. Still number one for Jeff. I appreciate Jeff recovering from me last week while I was recovering from uh, the tornadoes that hit uh, Northeast Ohio. Luckily, everything was was safe here. Just no power and internet. Now that I'm back, if you haven't heard before, I'm Justin Latter, the other co-host. You've read me at places like Guardians Baseball Insider, perhaps, or the News Herald, or the Morning Journal, uh, and here, and occasionally Prospects Live as well. Really nice to get back and be able to watch some live baseball. Uh, shout out to anybody who was at the Savannah Bananas game on Saturday. That was a lot of fun, different uh, kind of baseball, but it was fun to see Jason Kipnis and Corey Kluber uh, back in that one. So you can watch all those games on YouTube. So maybe after you're watching us and Locked on MLB, you can go and watch uh, that as well. But it's also good for the Guardians to win two games to finish the series against the Twins. Again, I mean, Jeff, I think you, you mentioned it last week too, just – this is a, this, what you want to do considering what the guardians have been good through lately was split the series, no matter how you do it. And we've talked about on the show for months, this season about it's more about timing than it is about, I mean, all, all series, all season long, we've talked about how the guardians just need to find a way to win every series. They have done that. And it's really more about timing. If you tell people all the time, well, Hey, you're going to go to Minnesota and you're going to take two or four people would take that. It's just a matter of perception when they do it. And yeah, Friday's not good. You lost two double headers in a week, you know, against Arizona, against Minnesota. That's hard to do, by the way. Sweeping double headers is very hard to do, and the Guardians managed to lose two of them within a week. Um, it was just a very, very that bad Arizona stretch. team. I'm going to again point out is like yeah, tough as good. nails. Like since you know, I did a lot of stuff in your eye about since July first, and I believe they have the highest WRC plus and the lowest pitcher FIP since July first. They are a tough team. And they've been missing Christian Walker for like a week too, and it didn't matter. They just Josh got Kyle went there, and yeah, and they just got Merrill Kelly back like today, and yeah, yeah, they're good. They're they're good they're roster be tough. for sure. Yeah, it was a tough series against Arizona, and then you know the, things were not feeling vibey going into Minnesota, but uh, the first two games, the first three two games, I should say, first three games uh, were were kind of rough in general. I mean, the, the split doubleheader, and then. It was a tough Saturday night as well, but the Guardians end up splitting the series. And the more important, important thing about that is that they now own the tiebreaker against the Twins. So they have a seven to two advantage over the Twins for the season. Uh, so the next four that are in Cleveland, by the way, Minnesota comes to Cleveland for the next the final four games of the regular season series. The Twins, I hope they don't win all four, but I mean, for the Guardians sake, but if they do, it doesn't matter. The Guardians have this, have the season series now against them. And again, for all of the negativity and all of the doom and gloom, the Guardians have won season series this season against Baltimore, the Twins, the Phillies. I'm sure there are other ones I can, I can, I mean, Boston, I think I don't know how great Boston is, but they have I mean, won they the might season make series. The playoffs. Like, don't, don't sleep on that Boston team. Yeah. So they have won the season series against, you know, some of the best teams in baseball this season. Uh, ironically enough, the one that is really up in the air is the White Sox. White I think Sox. it's the Tigers. Yeah. Um, I think they yeah. finally got to the Tigers, but it took a bit of time. Yeah, so 
they have season two, they have tiebreakers against some of the most important teams. They're going to play against the Yankees, so you're still going to have chances for that. If it comes down to that, you have the tiebreaker against the Mariners. I think the Astros. No, the Astros can't on the tiebreaker yet because they have to come to Cleveland. But you know, things are getting tight in the Central race. The Guardians don't have the lead they once had, but now they have the season series against the Twins. So if it does come down to a tiebreaker, the Twins have to win. A ha- have to you know be a game better than the Guardians at the end of the season. The Guardians are still playing at a 95 win pace, and I think. The Twins would have to be the Twins not have to be a game better than them the rest of the way um, to do that, and that gives the Guardians a little more cushion, and they they might need it as they go down the stretch because right now there are things that are up in the air. You know, we'll talk about the rotation, we'll talk about the lineup, and just balancing this roster, trying to avoid some of the peaks and valleys. But you leave Minnesota feeling pretty good. I mean, again, if you would have won the doubleheader and then lost Saturday Sunday, it's still the same result. Do you feel positive or feel negative? I think it just depends on when it happens. So. I guess you feel better. I, I feel better because Bobby and Williams both pitched really good and you found a way to win some tough games. Yeah. And I know just in terms of the podcast, it's better when they're on a winning streak at the end of the weekend than whether, you know, at the start of it. But yeah. And I, like Tanner, it was nice to see just because of the health. But I think mm-hmm. if we're being honest, like Gavin pitching like that after what was a less than spectacular performance last time, was was nice like it it was really good to see him come out and look like the guy that he could be against a really good lineup so that was that was incredibly uh positive at least for me in terms of what i was looking for um with with the pitching and you know if you look at it from a certain point of view like one of those games the double header was technically from the previous series so they took two out of three and two out of three they took both their their ones there they dominated that series and they took care of business and they worked overtime and they did everything they needed to do to, you know, get that lead back up. And yes, it's a tough schedule. It's a tough opponent. Uh, if you go back and you listen to me harping about bat pip all last week, look at when they scored five runs. That was all the bat pip. It was like two week hits, three week hits in a row. Like they have been unlucky. Eventually things will even out the same way. People, you know, the other side of it is we don't get too high. We don't get too low on here. When I was like, yeah, Quan's not going to hit 400 because he's not going to rock a 380 bat football year. This team is going to rock a, you know, a 257 or 253, whatever it was. So we're seeing some balancing out. I think things will get better um, overall. And I, I just, I mean, Tanner and Gavin look so good. Like right there, didn't that, it makes you feel good about the postseason seeing those two guys go. Yeah, now and now you have those guys lined up back to back too, and 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 mm-hmm. Stephen Vogt. I mean, again, I think I think people need to be careful, ourselves included, about how much stock we're putting into anything that Stephen Vogt says on a post game press conference. Like those are number one. You're hearing like three minutes of what might because you know you're you're probably watching on TV or you're listening on the radio. You're hearing like three minutes out of what could be like ten minutes. I don't know how long they're talking to. We don't hear we don't hear the full extent sometimes on on post games shows. Um, and, and, and even so, even in those three minutes, very rarely does he ever say something of value that you can really run with. Um, so he did say that, you know, it, he thought it was the best Tanner's looked all year. And he claims that's the best Tanner's felt all year. Tanner said, but Tanner did say that as himself. So if he feels that good, that's a great sign. Looked good. I mean, he had some, some balls left in the middle of the plate. Obviously Byron Buxton hit him for the one home run. He got a couple that he might've gotten away with, but he had 13 swings and misses and his fastball was good threw a ton of sliders that were, were okay. The changeup was good for him. He left a couple high, but that's okay. For a guy who didn't pitch for 12 days, you you were expecting some rust, and they wanted to be careful about his pitch count just being out for a couple of days. Um, and not only that, but now he has those days of rest. Like, that might be a blow to him. I, I don't want to compare situations but because it's not exactly the same. But I remember in 2016, I'm not saying Tanner's Corey Kluber, but Corey Kluber had to miss his final start of the regular season in 20, 2016 because of a, a quad or like a hamstring issue. So he went into the postseason like not having thrown in like 15 days. And it ended up being a blessing in disguise because obviously Cleveland needed him as rested as possible because he pitched, you know, 13 times or whatever it was in the matter of, of a month. So um, it was crazy. I'm not saying that's that's what's going to happen to Tanner or anything like that. But, you know, a little rest right now might not be the worst thing for him and um, he certainly looked good. And yeah, now you have him back to back with Gavin Williams, Tanner for the last year. Now, even going back to 2023, even though it wasn't a great season overall for the team, 
Tanner was your stopper a year ago. They won a, I mean, pitcher wins again, super not great stats, subjective, whatever. But the team consistently won with him on the mound following a loss last year. And he's had to play that role this year while still kind of learning about sequencing and, and introducing new pitches and just kind of taking on the role of ace, you know, after April. Um, but now you have arrested Tanner who looks good. You have Gavin Williams who looks good. And those guys are back to back now. So putting Tanner and Gavin back to back throughout the rest of the season potentially, you know, gives you two opportunities to really, you know, snap these losing streaks. If you have any of these issues like this, again, you've got your two best pitchers lined up back to back that can really help you avoid piling up any losses, which is obviously important for the team right now. Agreed. They're, they're in a good position. I know people don't want to hear that after that, but, but they lost seven in a row and they still have what a three and a half game lead. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah. Well, volume. technically it's technically it's, it's a four. four game lead because yeah. the guard, the, the, I mean, you'll eventually have to even things out. The twins had not played enough games yeah. um, to catch up to Cleveland. So, but you'll, you have a game advantage on that right now. I, I haven't looked at the Royal series, but um, they play again too. I'd have to look at that a little bit closer, but yeah, you have a, you have an extra game now cushion on the twins, which is, which is huge. So, Anything you do against them at this point, I don't want to say it's gravy because you have to keep winning, but at least you know you have that edge over them. So even if they win those four, it's really like they still have to win an extra game. So uh, we'll talk more about Alex Cobb and his uh, first start. We'll talk about the rotation, the way it's set up right now, and how good we feel about that. We'll talk about the bullpen. There might need to be some adjustments there because things are looking a little different these days in the bullpen, even though it's still one of the best bullpens in baseball. And we'll also talk about some of the roster moves of the weekend in terms of the position player side of things and um, if the Guardians are balanced enough and have enough uh, have enough balance overall to maintain, you know, some sort of consistency and avoid these uh, streaks they've had, so all that coming up. Get supplies from the site that's made for skilled trade. Supplyhouse.com. Supplyhouse.com is the reliable way to order plumbing, HVAC, electrical products online. An easy to use website that is packed with helpful resources, the latest product info to help you get the job done right. Shop a complete inventory of over 200,000 parts, over 400 top brands. Get your order delivered right to your door with fast shipping from coast to coast. Need help with an order? Get expert support and industry leading service from the friendliest folks in the business. Talk to a real person every time. Pros in the skill trades can get a competitive edge by joining supplyhouse.com's free trade master program. Every trade master gets access to a dedicated phone line, free shipping. And discounts on every order. Join the thousands of trade pros already benefiting from their free membership at supplyhouse.com slash T-M. Order plumbing, HVAC, and electrical supplies from anywhere. Just a few clicks at supplyhouse.com. Make sure you're checking out our good friends over at Locked On MLB. Our pal Sully does a great job getting you ready for the postseason. Talking about division races, what's going on each day in Major League Baseball. So, after you've come to us for your first listen, which we appreciate, head over to see our pal Sully over at Lockdown MLB, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network, your team every day. Jeff, the rotation every day, at least from here on out, we talked about it's Williams, it's Bybee. Lively, Ben Lively goes on Monday, the man of many options. Uh, Matt Boyd will make his Guardians debut on Tuesday, and then Alex Cobb will pitch on Wednesday. That is your rotation for right now. Uh What were your first impressions of Alex Cobb as a guardian? And it's an interesting rotation right now. You know, Carrasco is on the injured list with a strained hip, whatever that really means or doesn't mean. Um, Old people have have... hip injuries. That's what we know. If there's one thing we know in life, old people, you know, he, I I, I hope he, you know, he didn't fall and he couldn't get up. I mean, I, I sleep with a special neck pillow now, so I, I can definitely relate to that. Otherwise, I'd be on the injured list without my neck pillow. So maybe maybe it's right. Um, what were your first impressions of Cobb? And then just, you know, how do you feel about the setup of the rotation right now? Because, um, you know, San Shane Bieber and, you know, you don't have the Tristan McKenzie you're hoping for this year. Certainly don't have the Logan Allen in 2023. This is certainly an interesting looking rotation. You've got a couple of veterans back to back there with Cobb, Boyd and Cobb. I know Boyd's making his first start in over a year in the majors and Cobb's only made one major league start this year. Um, you know, Boyd's last minor league start was pretty good. It's a minor league start, uh, but his, his rehab starts have all been pretty good. I don't know. It feels like the potential is there for this rotation. I don't want to get, you know, too high or too low about it, but um, 
I don't know. It, it certainly has the potential to be very interesting down the stretch is, is the best I can put it. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I, I think there's a lot of risk um, with what they did. You know, I think the to me, almost the bigger story was the one that um, I believe Zach had where the twins like also liked and were intrigued by. Um, yes. By Dan Alex Hayes, Cobb. Actually. Oh, was that who it was? was it was Dan Hayes. Uh, okay. Yeah. I can't remember, but either way, it's like, they were interested in, in him, but couldn't afford the $3 million for his services. So instead, uh, they were never really involved in the whole, mm -hmm. um, the chase for cops. So I thought that, you know, for uh, over the last week, we've gotten a lot of comments about, you know, just how cheap the front office is and everything else in our comments, um, you know, in this and that. It's like, you know, they, they went out and, and got a guy at the deadline that can help them. That is not something that every team could sit back and say. That is definitely not something that, you know, the twins can sit back and say. Was it a great first outing? No. But for a guy who, you know, hasn't pitched this year, it was it was fine. It was, it, you know, there was definitely some points where I'm like, okay, I can see how this could be successful in the future. Yeah, I mean, he really threw one bad pitch. It was the 3-0 pitch he threw in the fifth inning to... Gosh, I didn't hit the home run. I'm looking it up now. I can't remember who it was. It was a 3-0 pitch. It was a homer. Um, was it Trevor Lawrence? It was Matt Walner. It was the fifth inning. It was Walner. Yeah, was, that's right. Yeah, it was just a 3-0, like just right down the middle. Um, I mean, that was really the only bad pitch he threw of the entire outing. I think outside of that, he pitched fairly well. Command issues were definitely there, which is not a surprise considering you know, it was his first major league start. He had only made like two or three rehab starts, and he had the blister, and you know, it's been a, a, a year of interruption for him, which is very hard for a lot of guys to navigate. But I guess you think that if anybody can navigate those interruptions, it's probably a guy like Alex Cobb because he's done it for a long time. And, you know, he is comfortable and familiar with Stephen Vogt. He is familiar with Craig Albernaz and he is familiar with um, Kai Correa. Not that those you know coaches necessarily matter in what he's doing, but he has some familiarity in the clubhouse, which is going to help him for sure. And he has the the competitive advantage of pitching in a playoff race, which, you know, I think helps a lot of guys too, but yeah, it was, it was a, a solid first outing stands one pitch. You could make the argument that Steven Vogt probably should have not let him pitch to Matt Walner there. I mean, Cade Smith was warming up, I think, or at one point was, and he came in after that, which um, was an interesting choice for sure. And the management of the bullpen overall this week was, was a little odd in general. Yeah. Um, there's but definitely also, some points where you're like, Oh, okay. yeah. You saw like a lot of a lot of Pedro Vila. You saw a lot of just moving guy, different guys into different roles. And I think I think vote was probably really just trying to manage a tough week. You had two double headers and you had a very tough two tough series in general with an Arizona and Minnesota. You had, you had the one off. They definitely had two off days because you had uh, Tuesday off after the weather. But I'll I'll say that he probably was trying to manage these guys' workloads and trying to get them through a tough week, but it was just some odd situations in general. But yeah, I thought Cobb was fine. Like I agree with you. I think you know you could see where this works. Take away the home run, you know it's it's five innings and and one run maybe, and you maybe win that game. I don't know. Three runs is not going to beat a whole lot of teams in baseball. It's certainly not going to be the Twins. The Twins have a great lineup. Let's be honest. Um, three runs is not going to beat them many days. They got lucky. I don't say they got lucky. They pitched very well on Saturday that they were able to win a game two to one which is a great sign, but you're not going to hold the twins to two runs a lot of times. So, or even one run. So, you know, they got to get better offensively and give their pitchers more cushion to work with, but yeah, we'll see what Cobb can do on Wednesday against the Cubs, whose lineup is arguably not as good as the twins, but I can see the potential here. I'll be curious to see how Boyd looks, but I can see the potential here. Lively has been reliable. And then you got Bobby Williams back to back, which is really nice. And then, you know, I can I, I can only hope that Cobb's performance goes up as he continues to to build starts back to back coming into this year. If there, I, I do feel like Cobb, you can at least feel like he'll be able to navigate coming back because he has a vet, he is a veteran. He has been through this before, even though it's been a, a, a big stop and start year. Boy, I think Boyd is actually more of a wild card than Cobb, believe it or not. Agreed. Uh, yes. I think mean, the the peaks for Cobb or higher. He's just, he's been that guy who's been in there and been a real steady guy for a lot of years for a lot of teams. Boyd is, he was an all-star last year. Yeah. yeah. Boyd, Boyd has had potential for years, but he never really delivered on like it. that. And it's one been a few years since he's been really good. He had one huge year. Um, like 21, wasn't it? And it's like, I just remember like being like, 
Tigers fans, you want to sell high. And I always remember someone yeah. sitting back and trying to tell me like, there's never been a guy like this available. You don't understand. I'm like, no, I understand. He's not proven. He had a good first half with inflated data. <laughs> like, I always remember that was one of the, my big arguments online, but that's why you always got to look at that advanced state. A lot of guys can have a good half and, and he did, but you know, you're hoping he'll be more of a back end guy. And that's, that's all you're asking for, for him at this point. Yeah. I mean, essentially right now with Bobby and Williams, you've got guys that have, you know, ace potential. They're kind of more like number twos at this stage of their career, especially with Williams missing most of the season. You've got lively who really is a four and then Boyd and Cobb are probably both four or fives as well. So it's just kind of a rotation that you're trying to, to but piece they've together. A, they've had a lot of guys performing like they're eights or nines. So four or five sounds great. It is. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is, again, this is like, hopefully you're taking what was a D to a, or an F to a C and that can really improve things. And it, what really matters is the bullpen and how you can set that up and who's available and who's working right now. We'll talk a little bit more about the bullpen. We'll talk about, just the roster imbalance on offense in general. I uh, also want to ask Jeff if he even gives a crap about uh, managerial ejections. We'll talk about that. But first, let's talk about sandals, sunscreen, snacks for kids. What do these all have in common? You're probably buying them a ton again this summer. Snacks for kids for me in particular. But don't stress out about the cost. Use Ibotta and get the cash on all of your purchases when you stock up on your summer essentials. It is a free app. That is what Ibotta is. That lets you earn cash back every time you shop. Even on hundreds of items from the groceries to beauty supplies, even toys. So you can make sure you're beating inflation no matter what you're purchasing. The average Ibotta user earns 250, 256 bucks per year. That could cover uh, what sometimes feels like the entire cost of snacks for kids. Um you know, or you can get something nice for yourself. It's free money. Who doesn't want that? Other apps give you points that don't amount to much. With Ibotta, you earn cash back that you can withdraw to your bank account, PayPal, or gift cards. Simply add offers in the app, unload your asset, upload your receipt, and voila, and the money is yours. You can save on over 2,400 brands at Chop at 1,000 Realtors. Right now, Ibotta is offering our listeners $5 just for trying by using the code Locked on MLB when you register. Just go to the App Store or Google Play and download the free Ibotta app to start earning cash back. Use the code Lockdown MLB. That is I B O T T A in the Google Play or App Store, and use the code Lockdown MLB. I love sports. I love them so much, I never want them to stop. But there's no playoffs going down right now. All you have is Major League Baseball and the WNBA. The Olympics are over. There's just fewer games. There's fewer things, and sports right now aren't sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. In the summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a booster bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. So head over to FanDuel.com and start making the most of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Guardians back at home on Monday. What a weird schedule, by the way. They went... They were at home against Arizona. They went to Minnesota for four, which was supposed to be three. And they come back home for three with the Cubs, and they go back on the road to Milwaukee, I think, or Milwaukee comes yep. here. No, it's Weird. in Milwaukee. I'm trying to get a press pass. We'll see how that goes. Ooh, fun. Uh, anyway, you can catch all that action on your SiriusXM app. Just search Guardians uh, to listen to the broadcast. Speaking of the broadcast, I uh, didn't hear this one. I, I think I did see him. This was, uh, I think, on Friday. It was on the, on the app. Um, Stephen Vogt. Got his first career managerial ejection. I can't think of any. I know some people were saying like the Guardians needed this. They were wanting to see him fired up or whatever. And and you know the balk call with Tim Heron, right? It was super super goofy. Um, I had some people who were saying, "Oh, I see this. I see this twitch. Or I see that." And other people who were saying like, "I ah, I don't see it." And and I don't know. Official scoring is very hard, and umpiring is hard. I'll be honest about that. I don't think I really know what a balk. I, mean, I know what a balk is when it's obvious, but I don't know what a balk is when it's like, I don't know. We let Mike Clevenger and and Nestor Cortez and all these other people get away with stuff like crazy for years when it comes to um, their windups and just all that yeah. kind of stuff. To quote a famous senator, <laughs> "I can't describe a balk, but I know what I what it is when I see it." Oh yeah, yeah, I I, I do know that expression. Um, I didn't, I didn't. I couldn't tell you if that was a block or not. I don't think it was, but I'm not an umpire. I don't have the training. And, you know, 
it didn't deceive the runner because his back was to the runner and the runner was on third base. So it was very weird, but I can't think of anything more trivial to get ejected over than a balk. Like Stephen Vogt came out and he was fired up about it. He didn't think it was a balk. I don't think it was a balk, but I, again, I don't know, but like, I don't know. Everyone's like, Oh, when you just seem to get fired up about something, I don't know that ejection really does anything for me. Like, does it, did it do something for the team? They still lost the game on, on Friday when he got ejected. They won two after, but I don't think there's any connection there. I don't know. Like, it, it felt like, I don't know, it felt like feigned, feigned anger, just feigned, uh, um, just trying to get fired up over something. It didn't do anything for me, and I don't I I would love to know if the team actually cared about it. Like, I know, I know the team wants to know the manager has their back, and I feel like even if he didn't get ejected over that, I don't think – they were going to think anything less of vote or they, didn't, they weren't going to think that he didn't have their back, but it just felt like a lot of feigned anger, not, not from vote, but just the idea that he needed to get fired up over something, you know? No, I don't disagree with you. Like, I mean, I don't care about ejections. That's I'm sure no one is shocked who really pays attention to the show that it would not be something that uh, gets me all uh, hot and bothered, but it's, it's one of those things where I, I think, you spend so much time around this dude, you know who he is. Like, I don't think mm-hmm. you need him getting ejected from a game to, to show you who he is as a manager. I just, I don't, that doesn't track to me. So I, it, you know, like I said it, it, it is what it is. I think it's fine. I'm not overly committed to it one way or another. I just think that, uh, it was a bad call. Uh, I, I do think that yeah. I do think it was a bad call. It was a phantom call. It made no darn sense. And, uh, the sooner we have robot umpires, the better. I don't know how robot umpires are going to call box, but I don't know. Can you, can you, I wish you could challenge it. Like I would love to see, and, and there was no explanation either. Like, like most of the time you never get an explanation from an yeah. umpire because they're just holier than thou and you can never question them. Like, I think someone said Austin Hedges has been getting fined a couple times this year because of it. You don't even hear about that, but like you can't question an umpire ever. And it's absolutely ridiculous. They have, they have that much power. Like I would have loved to have heard the umpire. They, they send a, what's called a pool reporter after the game is they assign one beat writer from both, you know, from either time, either side to go talk to an umpire about a controversial call. And you get one shot with one reporter. They don't get to face a, a, a throng of reporters. They get one guy. And you get like five minutes with him and, and the umpire doesn't have to answer anything. It's such a it's such a mess with how that's handled. But I would have liked to have heard an explanation like, hey, this is what I saw. And and vote, you know, didn't get an explanation from me. He just said this. He told vote like this is what he did. But vote didn't really go into a whole lot of detail about it. He said they had a conversation and I spent the rest of the game watching on TV like the rest of you. Um, it was just stupid. I mean, I you know, he stuck up for his guy who thought he thought got a raw deal. And I agree with him on that. It's just like it's one thing to go out there and stick up to you, for your guy. And that's fine. I think the ejection part of it is just like, I don't know. It's, it's feigned outrage to me. It's just, it's super weird, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Like where, where in life does anyone get that mad that quickly? Like, uh, am I wrong? Well, I mean, like, umpires, just... umpires can do it. You know, you say, um, you know, there are magic yeah. words, obviously like you don't say in a workplace anyway, but um, the managers, I mean, it, umpires just eject managers over the dumbest things. And they have such fragile egos and, a lot this of them think true. that they're that people are there to see them, and it's just it, the umpiring is such a mess across Major League Baseball. It's such a such a joke how it's handled, and and they have way too much power. And um, I'm not saying umpiring is easy or anything like that. I'm not saying they don't have a hard job, but it's like these guys, the ego is way too much, and and they have way too much control over the outcome of a game when you're looking for the players to make the the control the outcome of the game by playing it, but. I don't know. The ejection just, I think it just is a little overblown that they quote unquote needed it. And they didn't even win the game. They didn't, and, and they won the next night, but they won because Gavin Williams was like, I, I can't make any correlation of, wow, the Guardians felt really pumped up that Stephen Vogt got ejected for them and stuck up. He, he stuck up for his guy who got a bad call. I agree with that. It's just, you know, Gavin Williams pitched his rear end off on Saturday night and the bullpen was good. Um, bullpen, not so great Sunday, at least from one guy. We're running out of time here, Jeff, but yeah. Um, I hate to call it one guy, but man, Nick Sandlin is really struggling right now. It seems like there's some guys like, like right now, you, who do you trust in the bullpen right now? This has been the best bullpen in baseball all year. There's still a top five bullpen in baseball in the second half, but like Scott Barlow's had some bumps in the road lately. Tim Heron's had some bumps in the road lately. And, and that's common. They weren't going to pitch that great all season, 
But like right now, it's it's Cade Smith, it's Hunter Gaddis, and then Emmanuel Classe decided to go all Joe Borowski on a Sunday. But like, there's kind of a big three right now, and then everybody else, you're kind of like, let's let's hope this works. Like that's kind of how it feels right now. Yeah, no, I agree. You've got your big three, and then eh. and, and even Heron, I'm not, you know, quite uh, as confident in of late. So yeah, it's Sandlin is is the very kind of obvious whipping boy right now. He's just he has, and historically, he's a first half pitcher. Like we've seen him really struggle in the second half for his career yeah. too. Yeah, it's just it's not his slider is um, a year ago was excellent. This year it's terrible. And we looked at the data and there's. I, it, he's, it almost looks like there's too much movement on it and he's like, can't hit his spots now, which means either it's moving and guys are able to like, you know, maybe it's moving into the zone too often or it's, um, you know, moving out of the zone and he's walking to, I, I don't know. But at this point, when it comes time to make a change, like to me, Sandlin's the guy who should go. Yeah. He has not been the same since the back issue earlier this year. And if you want to go back to your, your favorite endpoint, July 1st, his FIP is five fifty. And that's because he has a strand rate of 90%. So somehow, even though he has the highest percentage of inherited runners scored allowed by a reliever, which again is when a guy comes in and has runners on and then they're not charged him, but they're charging somebody else. Salen's been put in that position a lot by this team because, you know, he comes in and he's the guy you're hoping gets a ground ball double play. So vote in the first half really trusted him with, with being able to come in and, and get the double play because that's what his pitch mix suggests. Um, it hasn't gone that way in the second half. It hasn't gone that way since he had the back issue. And he's again, he's still stranding 90% of runners, which suggests that he's getting a little bit lucky. 90% strand rate is really unsustainably high versus Kate Smith, who has had, you know, I think he had one hiccup. It wasn't even that bad. Um, he's allowed one inherited runner to score all season. That was Monday against Arizona. He's stranded 70% of runners since July 1st, which is actually about normal, maybe even a little unlucky. That's why his FIP is 091 since July 1st, because he continues to strand runners um, at, a, at a positive rate, but also a rate that's sort of unlucky. Um, could be even a little bit better for a pitcher as good as him. So I don't know. I think there could be a change there. You don't have Sam Henches. It doesn't look like for a while, which kind of stinks. Uh, maybe the rest of the season. I don't know. There, there are definitely some opportunities available in the bullpen. This is the best bullpen in baseball for most of the season. They're still a top five bullpen. That's what we said last week. Is this team capable of winning the division and going far in the playoffs with a bullpen that's just very good versus a bullpen that's an elite all-time bullpen? But like, do they need this bullpen to be one of the best bullpens of all time for them to go deep in the playoffs and win this division? Or are they good enough to win with a bullpen that's just like really good? You know what I mean? Like that's, I think that's what we're going to figure out the rest of the season. I still think this team's going to win the division. Um, you know, I think Biden Williams are going to be good enough and you still have your big three in the bullpen, but there are definitely some improvements to be made both on the bullpen side of things. And hopefully the rotation will prove us right in terms of Boyd and Cobb. And then there are definitely some tweaks to be made on the offensive side of things, which we didn't get into today, but as Jeff promised me before we started recording, there will be stuff that we don't get to today that we'll do tomorrow, which that'll be the offensive side of the roster. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I want to get into David Fry. Who's basically, um, against righties hitting like Miles Straw since since mid June, so we'll we got to talk about some We got to talk about yeah. Fry. We got to talk about there might be some things going on in the minors for us to discuss. There's gonna be a lot, so make sure you are tuned in every day. Big day promotion wise tomorrow. Yeah. yeah, so make sure you're tuned in, checking it out, joining us for the fun that is Locked On Guardians every single day. Remember, rate and review, hit that, do all the stuff. You know the stuff. Do the stuff. Thank you all for joining us, and go go Guardians.